Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth, in earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Psalms 15, 1, 2. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and work of righteousness and speak of the truth in his heart. That was from Psalms 15, 1, 2. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, sisters and brothers, I'd like to welcome to Bible Christian Scholarship with the Church Church. We're a little bit late today. We understand that. Messing around a little bit with a new design and everything. Make it a little more pleasing for you folks that are joining us online and on YouTube a little bit later. I'd like to thank Brother Derek for opening up. It's his first time reading, but the Lord is going to get us through this. Just like this is the first time for everything. Praise the Lord. This is the first time coming into the Word. It's the first time for watching us on Bible Christians, Fellowship of the Spirit. So again, we'd like to welcome everyone that's here today, watching us online, and that's tuning in later. The title of today's lesson is, His Mercy Endureth Forever. His Mercy Endureth Forever. And that's exactly what we're going to deal with today. We're going to deal with the Lord's mercy. And the way we're going to come at today into the Lord's mercy is we're going to look at it from the point of view of someone that is walking according to the commandments, statutes, and judgments of our God. So someone who is professing to be a saint, that's keeping the covenant or ten commandments, that's keeping the dietary law, that's keeping the cleanliness law to the best of their ability, that's keeping all of God's commandments, statutes, and judgments. And if you're anything like me, if you're doing this walk, sometimes you get stupid. And I mean big time. And we fall short. And when we do it, we fall short in ignorance. But nonetheless, we do fall short. And when we fall short, sometimes you think about, man, how can God ever even forgive me for the way that I am sometimes, for this wickedness that's in my heart? And God does say that you have to hate your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, even yourself. Or you cannot be his disciple. But we got to learn not to beat ourselves up all that fuck, sisters and brothers. Because what we have to do is we have to get back up when we fall short. And what we're going to do in this lesson today is we're going to bring it from that point of view. From a servant who falls short, who sees the error of his ways. And we're going to show you how abundant in mercy God is. How abundant in grace. How long-suffering he is. Because God's not out to trick us. God's not out to give us all these commandments and watch us fall short so he can do away with us and put us in the fire. This is all for our good. This is all, all of it, this daily walk that we do, the falling short, the feeling of guilt, the falling short, the realizing you've sinned, the falling short and seeing how your behavior affects others. We're going to deal with all this today. But we want to look at God's grace and mercy while we fall short through ignorance, how he corrects us as a father would his children, and he picks us back up, and he loves us, and he puts us back on that path. That's the way we're going to look at his mercy today. We're going to start this off in Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And we're going to start it off right in verse 1, brother. 118 and verse 1. When you get there, brother, go ahead. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Because of mercy endureth forever. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the nation of Israel say that his mercy endures forever. Go ahead, brother. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the priesthood say that his mercy endures forever. The house of Aaron or the Levites. Go ahead, brother. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. Let all his servants say that his mercy endures forever. He's not a respecter of person. 
This is open to all nations. Of course, we understand the protocol. We're not dealing with that today. Go ahead, brother. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. And this happens to each and every one of us. When we finally get to a point where we can't take life anymore, the way we're living it, and the Father's calling us, whatever way it was that we came in to be in his servant, the Lord called us when we were in distress, or when we were in distress, we called him, and he answered us, and he sets us in a large place. In other words, he takes care of us when we truly come to him. Go ahead, brother. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? And the Lord is truly on our side, and we should not fear what man can do unto us, regardless of the personal consequences. <laughs> You fear God and keep his commandments. That's walking with a perfect heart. Regardless of the personal consequences, we fear God and we keep his commandments. Let's continue. Let's go to Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus 20. <coughs> Exodus 20. Let's look at this merciful God that we serve, sisters and brothers. Exodus 20 and verse 1. When you get there, brother, go ahead. And God spake all these words, saying, uh -huh. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And God spake all these words, saying, Now we know when we're dealing with God here in this class, we're dealing with the God of the Bible, the God of the creation, the true and living God, the God of Israel. That's the God we deal with here. And he spake all these words, saying, he said, I'm the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and I brought you out of the house of bondage. Go ahead, brother. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth, neat, and that is in the water under the earth. Go ahead, brother. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, and a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate. And this God gave us commandments, and he said the one commandment, we shouldn't make any images or anything of anything and associate it with him. He says, because he's a jealous guy, and he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. We're going to go into this particular scripture in another place in a little bit. Go ahead, brother. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And he shows mercy unto thousands of them that love him. How do you love God? By keeping his commandments. And this is a long-suffering, very patient and merciful God who is abundant in grace and mercy. When we sin, by right, we should have died. And that should have been the end of it. But we've all sinned. We all should be dead. But yet the Lord kept us all alive long enough so that we can hear about his grace and mercy and have the opportunity to come and serve in him and be in his friend. Let's continue. Let's go to Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. Ezekiel 18. Now the Lord said he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation of the children to those that hate him. Let's make clear what the Lord is saying with some of this here. Let's go to Ezekiel 18 and pick it up at verse 17, brother. 18 and verse 17. Go ahead. That hath taken off his hand from the poor, and have not received him surely, nor increased, hath executed my judgment, have walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. So now you've got a son that's righteous. His father was wicked. Maybe his father was a drunkard, or he was into partying, or he was into Sunday church, or whatever, or he was just a foul, wicked person, whatever the case might be. But the son is righteous. He shall not die for the sins of the father. For the sins of the father. Okay? If he's righteous, the father's sins have no effect on whether or not he makes the kingdom. Go ahead and continue, brother. As for his father... Because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. So the father being a wicked individual or not keeping God's commandments, he's going to die for his sins. But the son's not going to die for the sins of the father. Go ahead, brother. 
yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and have kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall surely live. So now you've got a father and a son, one's wicked, one's righteous. The righteous is going to win, is going to live in his righteousness. And the wicked is going to die in his wickedness. But when you sin, when you sin, you have to suffer the consequences for sin. You can have your sin erased by God so you don't have to shed your blood for that sin, but you're still going to pay for that sin. And that's what a lot of sisters and brothers don't understand. These trials and tribulations you might be going through, it's absolutely because of sin. When you have an action, you have to have a consequence. We're going to show you the man after the Lord's own heart when he sinned had his city raised, but he still had consequences for his actions. And that's what the Lord was talking about in Exodus, where the iniquity of the father would be handed down for the third and fourth generation of those that hate him. There's consequences for sin, but you're not going to die for your father's sin. If you're righteous, you'll live for your righteousness. You can't point fingers with the Lord. All well, that woman you gave me, Lord, Adam tried that. Look where we're at now. And I know a lot of sisters try that with their hook. Oh, this no good, mother crackers. You know what? Hey, you can point all the fingers you want to point, but it's your righteousness or your wickedness that's going to put you in the kingdom or is going to put you in the fire. But there are consequences for sin. Every action has a consequence, whether it's a wicked, uh, wicked action or a righteous action. And that's that light we talked about a couple of weeks ago, letting your light shine. That righteousness. Tell us where you're at and continue, brother. On verse 20. Go ahead. The soul that sinned, it shall die. Yes, sir. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Praise God. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. That's right. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So you're on your own hook. You're on your own knowledge and your own actions. But if someone that's in your family or someone that's close to you, does wickedness, it's going to affect you. And the Lord said it's going to affect you to the third and fourth generation from the Father. You had a house that had to make sure you're walking right. Because this goes right downhill, sisters and brothers. As a head of house, you've got to make sure you're right. You, you want good for your children. Well, you don't want the, the Lord's vengeance on your children because something you did. Solomon sinned in the eyes of the Lord. Turned away from the Lord. And it was his sons that paid for his wickedness. Although they were on their own hook for their wickedness and their righteousness. Think about this. Let's continue. Let's go to Acts, the 13th chapter. Acts, the 13th chapter. Let's take a look at an example. Acts 13. Acts 13. And let's pick it up at verse 21. Acts 13 and verse 21, brother. Go ahead. And afterwards they desired a king, and God gave him unto them Saul, son of Sid, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. So now Israel had judges that used to judge them. When they had a problem, they bring it to the judges, and the judges would use righteous judgment, and the judges would judge Israel. Well, now they didn't, they weren't satisfied with judges. They wanted a king. So the Lord said, You want a king? Give him a king. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you Saul, the son of Sid, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. So the Lord gave them Saul a Benjamite to be king over Israel. Go ahead, brother. And when he had removed him, he raised up and to them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So now the Lord removed Saul from being king over Israel and replaced him with David, who the Lord said was a man after his own heart. In other words, King David, or this David that was going to be king at this particular time, had the same attributes, the same judgment, the same mercy, the same long-suffering as the Lord. He was a man after the Lord's own heart. He was a righteous person. He wasn't wicked. Go ahead and continue, brother. Of this man's seed have God, according to his promise, raised him to Israel a savior, Jesus. It is by David's lineage, under the lineage of David, that our Messiah or the Christ Jesus was born. Let's go to 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter. Let's 
Let's look at this King David a little bit. First Samuel 13. First Samuel 13, and we're going to pick it up right at verse 13, brother. 13 and 13. Go ahead, brother. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now, for know that the Lord have established thy kingdom on Israel forever. Uh -huh. But now the kingdom shall, shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him, a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Uh -huh. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded to thee. So Saul didn't keep the commandments of our God. God commanded Saul to do certain things, and Saul went about, and he did the certain things, but he didn't do it perfectly like the Lord told him. Just like when the Lord told him to go in and kill everyone. He kept the king alive, and he kept the best animals for a sacrifice. But the Lord said, go in and kill everything that pleases. So he didn't do it with a perfect heart. He kept God's commandments, but not to the letter. Not the way the Lord said to do it. Let's go to 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. And brother, when you get there, we're going to pick this up right at verse 1. 2 Samuel 11 and verse 1. Go ahead, brother. And it came to pass after the year had, was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbit. But David still at Jerusalem. So now David was a king and he was a mighty king and he was great in battle. He was a strong king and he'd go out and he'd man. The Lord was with him and everything that he wanted, he took. Everyone he wanted to destroy, he killed. He was a mighty man of valor, mighty man in the field, mighty man at war. But this particular time, he stayed back and he sent Israel out in battle. And David at this time was blessed by the Lord. He had everything anybody could ever imagine. David, at a young age, became king of Israel, was given wives and concubines, had the respect of the entire nation of Israel. This is the brother that had it all. And the Lord was behind him 100%. Verse 2, go ahead and continue, brother. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off his bed uh -huh. and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing himself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Go ahead, brother. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Uh -huh. And David sent messengers and took her. Now, right there, David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? What, was she married? Oh, man, okay, cool. Hey, I better go back inside. I can't be looking at this woman. That should have been his response. David's got everything right now. He got lackadaisical. I can't speak for his mindset here, so let's just read what happened. Go ahead and continue, brother. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came into him, and he laid with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, uh -huh. and she returned to her house. So David went, and he took Bathsheba, who was purified from her uncleanness, and he went and he laid with the sister. And when he got done sleeping with her, he sent her back to her house. Go ahead, brother. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And so the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, listen, dude, you got me pregnant. I got to have your baby. And this is a married woman. And David knew this woman was married because when he inquired about her, they told her it was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Skip down to verse 14 and continue, brother. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. Uh -huh. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Yet ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. So now you can read this out in your own, but David sends for Uriah the Hittite and brings him back from the front lines. He gets him drunk. He tries to get him to go over there and lay with his wife. I mean, he's beguiling Uriah the best he can, trying to deceive him to cover up his sin, to cover up what he did. He got Uriah the Hittite's wife pregnant. But Uriah's a righteous man. He ain't got nothing to do with it. He's telling David, wait a minute, man. All my brothers are out there on the front lines, and they're battling. I mean, how can I, with a good conscience, come home and lay with my wife? I should be up there right now. So it doesn't work. Everything David tried to do to get him to sleep with his wife, got him drunk, sent him home, he slept at the doorstep. 
he would not go in. He was a righteous man with honor. So David turned around and said, well, I, this can't be. I got his wife pregnant. I got to do something. David's going to have conspired to have him murdered here. Go ahead, brother. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah into a place where he knew that valiant men were. Uh -huh. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah and the Hittite died also. So now not only did David commit adultery, okay, but now he's conspiring to kill the woman he slept with to kill her husband. So he won't find out that David got her pregnant. Skip down to verse 26 and continue, brother. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her. And of course, when the wife found out that Uriah was dead, she mourned for him. She goes into a period of mourning and she's crying. Her husband just got killed. Even though she had that moment where she committed adultery, obviously it's the great king of Israel. Not that that should have been any kind of swaying thing to get her to go against God's commandments. But that is a pretty big order. You got the king calling you to counsel. You don't know what it's all about. Then you get there and you're in the presence of the king and one thing leads to another. But when he finds, she finds out that her husband's dead, she goes into mourning. Go ahead, brother. And when the morning was passed, <coughs> David sent and fetched her to his house. And she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done is pleased the Lord. So now the thing that David did with committing adultery and then having... Uh, as Sheba's husband Uriah killed, this was not pleasing to the Lord. It's against his commandments. We know this. You don't even know the commandments of the Lord. And you have a situation like this with your next door neighbor trying to sleep with your wife. And you know this is wrong. So David, whether or not he knew, isn't the issue. The point is he sinned against God. He sinned against God. That's the issue here. Let's go to 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. And let's pick it up at verse 5. From 2 Samuel 12... And verse 5. Go ahead. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Again, we can't cover everything, but now Nathan the prophet went up to Daniel and told him a story about a poor man had one lamb, and a rich man had all these flocks, and the rich man was throwing a party and killed the poor man's lamb that he used to feed at the dinner table, treat him like a pet, like his own child. And this man, when David heard about this, his anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he told Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. David's going, I'm not standing with this unrighteousness in my kingdom. And then what happened, brother? Go ahead. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Uh -huh. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. The you that rich man, David. You're the one that did this to that poor man that had one lamb. Go ahead, brother. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And you go back into the book, if you're new here, and you don't know about the story about David and Saul, how Saul was king, and he became jealous over David, and how Saul was trying to kill David, and then the Lord took his spirit off of Saul, and Saul got wicked and ran all over trying to kill David. And the Lord kept delivering David out of Saul's hand. But you've got to be dead on your own. Go ahead, brother. And I gave thee <coughs> thy master's house, and thy master's wives, and to thy book, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. Uh -huh. And and if that had been too little, I would moreover have given thee, given unto thee such and such things. And the Lord blessed David so abundantly, David had no need or want of anything. And the Lord even told David, man, if that wasn't enough, all the things I had given you, I would have given you even more. All you had to do was ask. Go ahead, brother. Wherefore has that despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite of the sword. So the Lord told David, you killed Uriah the Hittite. That's murder. Go ahead. And has taken his wife to be thy wife. And that's adultery. Go ahead. And has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Uh -huh. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house. So see, David said... A consequence of his action is the sword will never depart from his house. Nothing but strife the rest of his days. Go ahead, brother. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Uh huh. Look Thus, what the Lord told David. Because you have despised me. David's going to write about this in Psalm 51. We're going to check that out in a little bit. David, by sinning, despised the Lord. 
That's the problem with the sin. The consequence of that action, it comes right downhill, sisters and brothers. Everyone gets affected. Go ahead, brother. Thus said the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house. Uh -huh. And I will take thy wife before thine eyes. Just like David did. Go ahead. And give them into thy neighbor. What you sow is what you reap. You're going to lie on a brother. You're going to cheat and steal from a brother. It's going to turn around and come right back on you. What you sow is what you reap. That's why the Lord said, sow you up treasures in heaven, not on earth, where moth and rust does corrupt it. Sow you up the good kind of treasures. Go ahead, brother. And he shall lie to <laughs> thy wives in the sight of this son. Uh huh. For thou this, for thou this it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And the Lord said, "You did all this wickedness. You did it secretly. But I'm going to do all this to you in front of everybody." Go ahead, brother. And David said to Nathan, "I have sinned against the Lord." Look what David said: "I have sinned against the Lord." Now, when you go back to Saul, when Samuel came up to Saul and said, "What is this you've done?" You should have kept the commandments of God. He didn't say, oh, my God, I have sinned. He said, oh, yeah, but, you know, I kept the best of animals to sacrifice to him. He didn't even acknowledge his sin. He wasn't giving his best. He wasn't serving the Lord with a perfect heart. Because how could something so simple as kill everything have gotten away from him? And then when he's reminded of that, oh, well, you know, it ain't no good deal. I kept the sacrifice. He didn't even hear it to obey but David did it with a perfect heart. As soon as David found out that he had sinned, he repented. Go ahead and continue, brother. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. So the Lord put away David's sin because David was a man after God's own heart. David was serving the Lord with a perfect heart. Everything the Lord said do, David to the best of his ability was doing. And the Lord knew the difference in the heart of Saul and the heart of David. And David was a man after God's own heart. Because you can read the story of David. David did everything to the best of his ability with a perfect heart. And he did fall short. And he did sin. But God covered his sin. That sin right there falls right under the shed blood of Christ Jesus. But the Lord still was going to hold him accountable for that sin. There were consequences that had to be paid for that sin. Why, when you struggle, sisters and brothers, you've got to keep it in your heart that this is a merciful God. And when you struggle, we're going to show you a little bit later, there's something called chastisement, correction. This is the perfect God who set this way of walking up perfectly for our good. When you're getting slapped around and you're getting beat around a little bit, don't fall too far into remorse. This God wants you to get back up and correct yourself and be that light. Let's continue. Let's go to 2 Samuel 24, chapter. <coughs> Excuse me, 2 Samuel 24. <coughs> 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. And we're going to pick this right up at verse 10. One verse, verse 10. 24 and 10, brother. Go ahead. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. But now the Lord didn't want David numbering the people, and he was moved to number the people. So he numbered Israel. And it's another foolish sin that David did. And as soon as David found out that he did this other sin, he repented. He repented, sisters and brothers. That's the key to this. When you're miserable and you don't know what's going on with you, or you start sliding away, you get away from your book or whatever, and the Lord starts beating you up, stop and take a look at your walk. Stop and take a look at what it is you're doing. Take a look at yourself. That's why we put that mirror up in front of us, to keep us straight. Because your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, has nothing to do with your salvation. You've got to be the one that stands up when things aren't going right and look in the mirror and check yourself first. Then we go to God and we look for mercy. Then and only then, but we got to look at ourselves first. Let's continue. Let's go to 1 Chronicles, the 21st chapter. 1 Chronicles, the 21st chapter. We're still dealing with David. 1 Chronicles 21. 
Let's look at the reaction of David when he sins. Let's look at his reaction when he finds out he sins. First Chronicles 21, one verse, brother, verse 17. 21 and 17, go ahead. And David said to God, is it not that I commanded the people to be numbered? And David said, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? I did this. He'd already admitted his sin to God. He said, Lord, I did this sin in your sight. Go ahead. Even I, it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? But as for these sheep, talking about Israel, his nation that he's king over, he says, Lord, they didn't do anything. Sometimes when I fall short at home, and I get all crazy and I do something, or if I fall short on the road somewhere, at work or whatever, and I get a little out with the mouth, or I don't act completely Christian-like, my prayer, and this is just me, to the Lord is, please, Lord, don't let this affect their day. If it's in front of my children, don't let it affect them. Let it go. Lord, only you have the power. Let it go right over their head like it never happened. If I have words with my wife, or if I have words with someone at work, or a disagreement with someone, wherever it might be. I've been traffic. I'm human like everybody else. Somebody cuts me off, and I lay on the horn, and I don't use number one anymore, but I might throw my fist in the air and go, oh, Father, forgive me. But Lord, don't hold this. Don't let them be affected by my wickedness. That's the prayer of David here. He said, I commanded the people to be numbered. Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Go ahead, brother. Let thy hand, I pray thee, uh -huh. O oh Lord my God, be on me, and be on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. But not on the people that they should be plagued. I'm the one that's done this sin. Correct me, Father, but not these other people. Because every sin has, every action has a consequence. And when you sin, those consequences are not favorable. And they roll downhill. They affect other people around us. Even though the most important thing is we're sitting against our God. Who has commanded us not to do that. This is all part of our daily walk, sisters and brothers. And this is all part of what we go through from time to time. But we got to remember, our God is ever merciful. A live dog is better than a dead lion. As long as you have breath, you have a chance to repent. Who knows whether or not the Lord will be merciful. He says he has mercy on whom he has mercy. That covers a lot right there, sisters and brothers. And if you're truly repentant and you turn at him, who knows if he might not have the sure mercy of David on you. Did you finish that 17th verse, brother? Yes. Let's go to Psalm 51st chapter. Let's look after Uriah, or after uh, David, committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah the Hittite. Let's look at his prayer of repentance. Psalm 51st chapter. Let's pick it right up the first one, brother. Go ahead. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy love and kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. And that's every one of our hope when we sit through ignorance and we come before the Father. And that's another point that just reminded myself I wanted to touch on. When you sin through ignorance, you sin. That's what it is. And sin is no different. Whether it's through ignorance or presumptuously, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Sin is sin. And sin is going against the commandments of our God. Now, here's the difference with presumptuous sin and ignorance. When you do it through ignorance, it's not conscious in your heart that you're going to purposely turn away from your God. And if you completely presumptuously sin, that's a complete turning away. There's a difference with struggling with something, saying, man, I shouldn't do this. Oh, this ain't this. Oh, Lord, give me strength. Oh, why did I do that? And saying, you know what? It's the Sabbath day. I know I should be at class, but skip it. I'm going shopping to get that new car. There's a difference with presumptuous sin and sin through ignorance. Presumptuous sin, you don't care what God has to say anymore. You're done with living according to the way he said to live, and you're purposely, yeah, I know that's the way he wants me to live, but skip it. I ain't doing it no more. That's presumptuous sin. Falling short sometimes can look like presumptuous sin. And only your own heart can answer that. But some of those things that Paul talked about, the things I do I hate, or the things I hate I do, and the things I do I hate, he's talking about this walk, this battle with the flesh. And that's the battle that we all put up with on a daily basis in one way, shape, form, or another. 
Okay? Psalm 51, verse 2. Go ahead, brother. Wash me thoroughly from my and cleanse me from my sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Remember, this is the brother that's already walking according to commandments, statutes, and judgments who has fallen short. Repentance, sisters and brothers, is repentance. There's two kinds. Oh, I repent because I got caught, and I repent because I've sinned against you, Father. You got one is just eh, the other was a perfect heart. Go ahead and continue, brother. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And that's that's repentance, acknowledging that you've done it and turning from it. Go ahead. Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. And it's only against God that we do sin. But remember, every action has consequences. Go ahead, brother. Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, uh -huh. and in sin did my mother conceive me. Go ahead. Behold, thou de desire of truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And that's where the Lord desires the truth, when no one else is watching. That's why he said, or one of the reasons he said, when you pray, don't do it on the street corner. Go in your closet by yourself and pray unto me. Pray unto me in secret. He wants perfect righteousness in the hidden parts, in secret, not out in public in front of God and everybody. Oh, look at that brother, so righteous. And then the brother, when he's behind closed doors, is the most wicked person you could ever imagine knowing. He wants it in the secret parts. Go ahead, brother. Purge me with his up. And I shall be clean. If God purged you, you shall be clean. Go ahead. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. David was completely filthy, and the Lord hid his sin and cleansed him and made him white as snow and washed him, and he was made clean. But he still had to suffer the consequences. Go ahead, brother. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken and made joy. Uh huh. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Yes, sir. Rate in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, right spirit within me. Uh -huh. Cast me not away from my presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's what he did to Saul. He took that Holy Spirit from Saul. He didn't take it from David, though, because David was trying to serve him with a perfect heart to the very best of his ability, and Saul didn't. Go ahead. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Yes, sir. Then will I teach transgressors thy way. And sinners shall be converted into me. Sisters and brothers, your past is your biggest asset sometimes when it comes to serving God. Because you come across a sister or brother in your travels who wants to hear the word of God, but is so beat up by their sins that they don't even believe that a God can be so loving that would forgive them of the wickedness that they admit they have done and they're so shameful of. But look at what David said here. When you cover my sins, Lord. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to teach transgressors their ways. And sinners shall be converted unto you. And I'm going to teach them about you, Lord. And you sit down in front of somebody who's got a past just like yours. And you gain their confidence. And you tell them about the way you were and how this God has changed you. Your past just became your biggest asset. Right along with the word of God, you can teach someone how to be forgiven. How to walk in righteousness. But you've got to acknowledge your filthy thoughts. You got to be forgiven when you fall short first. You can't sweep your unrighteousness under the rug when you sin through it. The sin is sin. And sin is an abomination in God's eyes, no matter who does it. Go ahead and continue, brother. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing loud thy righteousness. Yes, sir. O Lord, open thy my open thou my lips, and my mouth shall shoot forth thy praise. Uh-huh. Without desire of not sacrifice, else would I have given. Though the though the light of night burnt offering. And the Lord never delighted in sacrifices and burnt offerings. It was never about killing of animals. It was about getting justification for man's sin. Go ahead, brother. Without without the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a concrete heart. O oh God. Thou will not despise. And that's the heart that's right with God. When they realize that they sin or backslid, that they're willing to come before God and repent. Because without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Without acknowledging that you're falling short or sinning, there is no forgiveness. You can't just call on the name of Jesus and start keeping the Sabbath day. You have to repent. You 
before you're baptized. Not just go for a swim. Go ahead and continue, brother. Do good and I good pleasure in Zion. Build out the walls of Jerusalem. Uh -huh. Then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, the burnt offerings, and with whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullets upon thy altar. And when you repent and you turn back to the Lord and you start walking the way he would have you walk, then you can offer those sacrifices of bullocks and of rams and of whole burnt offerings and everything else. Then they will be pleasing the eyes of God. But as long as you're wicked, he you don't hear nothing. Of course, today we don't sacrifice animals. But if you're wicked today, the Lord even said, don't take your prayer, leave it at the altar and go make things right before you come to me. Let's continue. Let's go to Psalm the 18th chapter. Let's back it up a little bit. Psalm the 18th chapter. Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Well, let's pick it up at verse 2, brother. 18 and verse 2. Go ahead, brother. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation. In my high tower. Yes, sir. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Take a look at what mine enemies is here. Go ahead, brother. The sorrows of death and past me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. We're going through our everyday life and we just deal with what we deal with when we come up. We're always dealing with unrighteous men. But you know the biggest unrighteous man you deal with? Look in the mirror. You're the biggest enemy. Yourself. You stop guarding your heart. You stop chasing the Lord. You stop trying to get understanding of him. You stop trying to serve him the way he says to serve him. And sometimes it's so subtle that it just slips away from you. And months can go by and you realize the only time you're picking up the books out of Satan. Because Satan is a deceiver. And he puts that, that stuff in your heart and then make no doubt about it. It's your own lust that takes you away. But Satan's right there. He dangling in that carrot in front of the horse. You're your worst enemy. Go ahead and continue, brother. The sorrows of death <laughs> compass me. Uh -huh. and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compass me about. The snares of death prevented me. Uh -huh. In that distress, I called upon the Lord and cried upon my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my pride came before him, even into his ears. And when you're struggling, and when you're, you can't put your finger on what's going on, and you cry to your Lord, because all this wickedness and evil is compassing you about, and sometimes it's in your own head, between your own ears and your own heart, you cry upon the Lord. And when you cry upon your God, he's going to hear you, because he's not trying to trip you up. He's on your side. He's trying to give you what you need to make it back to the reason you were created, to live and reign with him, to be God, just like him. What the book says, he's not trying to lay a stumbling block for you. This is simplicity, fearing him and keeping his commandments. Don't get caught up with all the, the crazy stuff that we can get caught up in. Get yourself straight first and realize that this God is ever merciful. And his mercy endures forever. And he wants you to make it. He's not trying to trip you up. He knows to your heart. He looks in your heart. Even when you are sinning, if you're doing it to ignorance, and then you come down to the realization of what you're doing, and you go, oh, man, how can this God forgive me for this junk now? Know that he's ever merciful and he's on your side. He wants to forgive you. But it's just like that child at home, sisters and brothers. You tell your son, quit throwing the ball in the house, quit throwing the ball in the house, quit throwing the ball in the house. Who throws the ball in the house once too many and it breaks that $500 fixed screen TV you got up on the wall? Dad, I'm sorry. I know, son. I know you are. Ah, oh, Dad, I mean it. I'm really sorry. I'll get a job. I'll pay you whatever. Yeah, I know you're sorry, son. And I forgive you. But you won't pay for that. Because I told you not to do that. It's the same way with the Lord. He gives us that example of a father and his children. It's the same way with our God. Skip down to verse 16 and continue, brother. He said from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy uh -huh. and from them which hated me. For they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was, was my state. Uh -huh. 
He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. So why did he delight in you? All this that we're reading about here might be you looking in the mirror. These enemies that are camping around me and camping around me and all this stuff, and you're looking at all this wickedness around you, it might be you. And you don't know why. You can't put your finger on it. So you call upon the Lord. And the Lord is going to hear you, and he's going to deliver you because you're his people. You're striving to serve him and keep his commandments. You're going to fall short, sisters and brothers, but you've got to stop that guilt at the point where you beat yourself up to the point where you backslide, beat yourself up, but then get back on track. Keep that mirror in front of you. That mirror is your best friend, especially when you don't know what's going on around you. You take it to prayer, and you look at yourself. Tell us where you're at. Continue, brother. Verse 20. Uh -huh. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands, as he would be comforted. So the Lord rewards you according to your works, according to your righteousness, and that's why he delights in you. According to the cleanness of my hands, that he recompensed me. He's always looking at your righteousness. He don't care what you did five minutes ago. He wants to know what you're doing in the situation right now. Go ahead, brother. For I have kept the ways of thy Lord, and have not wickedly departed from uh -huh. my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away the statutes from me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. That doesn't mean you won't fall short. The biggest mistake I ever made coming into the truth, or coming into the word of God, and becoming his servant, was thinking that when I came into this thing, I was never going to sin, even though I heard it from the podium. So every time I fell short, I beat myself up. Now I'm telling you I beat myself up big time. And I did this for years, and that almost caused me to slip and fall. But this Lord is not a God that is against you. He wants you to make it, and he's going to give you everything that he can give you, every tool imaginable, for you to be able to get that right back in the tree of life. But he's got to correct you when you fall short. Go ahead and continue, brother. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. And you are upright before him, and you keep yourself from your iniquity, but you're still going to fall short inadvertently at times. Go ahead, brother. Therefore have the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanliness of my hands and his eyesight. And not only does he recompense you according to his righteousness, according to the cleanliness of your hands and his eyesight, he recompenses you according to your wickedness too, even if it's through ignorance. You have to pay for your sins. You're going to do it one way or another. Go ahead, brother. With the merciful, thou wilt show them thyself merciful. And with the merciful, God will show himself merciful, because that's what he's grooming you for. He's trying to instill in you all his attributes, mercy, tenderness, loving kindness, meekness, humility, long-suffering, or patience. He's trying to instill all this in you through serving him, through his word. That's why the longer you serve him, the more you recognize situations as you get older in his word, as you grow more spiritually. All of a sudden, a situation comes up. When you were young in the Word serving Him, you might have fallen for something. Now you see it come and go, oh, I, I learned the last time. I'm not going that way. Right? It's spiritual growth, sisters and brothers. And if you're not growing spiritually and you're getting stagnant, you need to take a look at yourself and find a way that you're not going to stay stagnant, that you're going to continue to grow. Did you finish that, brother? Second part of one. Go ahead. With an upright man, thou wilt show himself upright. And with an upright man, God will show himself upright. What does that say if you're completely wicked? That's a scary place to be. Let's go to 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, and let's pick it up at verse 6, brother. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may assault you in due time. Go ahead, brother. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You need to humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When you sin, 
you fall short or you're just completely, your, your whole life is upside down and you don't know why and you're looking at yourself, you need to humble yourself before your God. Don't point fingers at, why you doing this to me, man? What's so different about you? Humble yourself before your God. Cast all your cares upon him. That's what he wants you to do. He already knows what's going on with you. He knows everything. He's got He's got them seven spirits go to and fro and report back to him just like he let Satan go to and fro and Satan report back to him. He's got them seven spirits doing the same thing. And when you're calling upon God and you're humble before him and you cast all your cares upon him, he wants to take care of you. And when you get into that funk and you're casting all your cares upon God, he's going to reveal to you why you're so miserable. And give you that opportunity to take the corrective action. Let's take a little bit of a look at, uh, at God's attributes. Let's go to Exodus, the 33rd chapter. Exodus, the 33rd chapter. I call these attributes, okay? Or this is the way God conducts himself. His personality, whatever you want to call it. And this is what we're supposed to be striving to be right here. Exodus 33. Exodus 33. And brother, let's pick it up in verse 17. 33 and 17. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Now Moses, the Lord said that he found grace in his sight. And Moses said, well, I want to see your glory. I want to see all about you, God. And Moses, and God said, well, since you have found grace in my sight, I'm going to do this one thing you've asked me for. Go ahead, brother. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Uh -huh. And he said, I will make all of God in his path before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm going to proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Go ahead. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And that's God keeps saying this over and over and over again. All over the book. Several places. I'm going to be gracious to whom I be gracious and show mercy to whom I'm going to show mercy. That's why when you slip and fall, don't throw that towel in. As long as it didn't kill you and you didn't just say, I know I'm not supposed to do this, skip it, I'm done serving this guy. Get back on track. Because a live dog is better than a dead lion. Dead lion lays there, live little chihuahua goes up, kicks him in the snoop, bites him on the ankle or whatever. The lion's dead, it ain't doing nothing. The live dog turns around and walks away. When you're alive, you still got that chance. You got that chance at repentance. You got that chance at repentance. What verse do you have, brother? Did you finish that? You finished 19, Exodus 34, and let's pick it up at verse 5. 34 and verse 5. Go ahead, brother. And the Lord descended into thy cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So the Lord descended into the cloud. He put Moses in the cloud of the rock, said, You can't see my face, but when I go by you, I'll put my hand over you, I'll let you see my back parts. So he put Moses in the, in the cloud of the rock. And he descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. Go ahead. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, very patient. Go ahead. And abundant in goodness and truth. And abundant in goodness and truth. Go ahead. Keep in mercy for thousands. Keep in mercy for thousands. Go ahead. And forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That's his business. It's to bring you to him. Don't be so prideful that when you start falling short, you can't be corrected. Go ahead, brother. And that will, and that will by no means clear the the guilty. And he's going to be merciful in the thousands, and he's going to forgive iniquity and transgression and sin, but that by no means will clear the guilty. You still got to suffer for the guilt or for, for the sins. You still got to pay for them, but you're not going to pay for them with your blood. Go ahead, brother. Visiting the iniquity of our fathers upon our children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Remember, every action has consequences, sisters and brothers. Let's continue. Let's go to Numbers, the 14th chapter. Numbers, the 14th chapter. Let's look how God loves and cares for us. Numbers, the 14th chapter. Numbers 14. Sisters and brothers, we'll pick it up in verse 17. 14 and 17. Go ahead, brother. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great. According as thou hast spoken, saying, uh -huh. The Lord is long suffering and in great mercy. 
forgiven iniquity and transgression, and by no means cleansing the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. See, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, and He's forgiving iniquity and transgression. But that doesn't clear the guilt. Go ahead and continue. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven his people from Egypt even until now. And Moses is saying, Lord, pardon, I beseech you, I'm begging you, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people all the way from Egypt all the way until now, Lord, forgive them. Go ahead. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. And the Lord told Moses, I pardoned according to your word. I have, I cleared their guilt. I'm not holding them accountable for this sin. Go ahead. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. But as truly as I live, all the earth is going to be filled with the power of the Lord. He's going to forgive the sins. He's going to forgive the iniquity. Your actions will continue to have consequences. You can't take that away. But this Lord is a Lord that his business is being long-suffering, of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. He's a merciful God. He's on your side, sisters and brothers. When you slip and fall short, it's just like going to your mother or father and asking for forgiveness when you do something crazy at home. You get up and you continue to follow him. You're falling out of the book, you get back in the book. You start reading again. Your conversation starts turning. Get back on track. But it all starts with repentance. You have to come back to him. You have to repent for your iniquities. If you don't, the curses of this book will be upon you. And the biggest curse of this book that will be upon you is that lake of fire. Let's continue. Let's go to Proverbs, the 29th chapter. Proverbs, the 29th chapter. Proverbs. I'm sorry, I still got 22 and 23. Getting ahead of myself here. Thank you, brother. You never tell me. He never read me. So go ahead and continue verse 22, brother. Back to Numbers. I'm sorry. Back to Numbers uh, 14. And we're going to pick it back up in verse 22. Go ahead, brother. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracle, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, I have not hearkened to my voice. Uh -huh. Surely I shall not see the land which I swear unto thy father. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. So the Lord said he was going to forgive their transgressions, but because of their sin, there was consequences that had to be done, and they weren't going to see the land. They sinned against the Lord, and the Lord was not going to put them into the promised land. Now let's go to Proverbs 29. Chapter. Thank you again, brother. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. And one verse, brother, verse 19. 29 and verse 19. Go ahead. A servant will not be corrected by words. For though you understand, he will not answer. Let's deal a little bit with, with uh, chastisement. Okay, remember, we're dealing with that daily walk and the daily mercies of our God. We're going to deal a little bit with chastisement. Because though a servant, a servant will not be corrected by words. For though he understands, he will not answer. Sometimes you got children at home. You tell them to do something, yeah, yeah, yeah. They think it's playtime. You tell them again to do something, yeah, yeah, yeah. They think it's playtime. The servant will not, though he here will not be corrected by words. Now you either correct them physically by giving them a couple of swats, or you correct them however it is that you put them in a corner for a while, give them quiet time or whatever. A lot of people take that, beat them with the rod, they shall not die, thinking it's just whooping their backside. But it's not, it's correction. When the Lord says, beat them with the rod and they shall not die, he's not talking about whooping their butt. He's talking about correct that child. Sometimes the butt whoopings him. Sometimes there's not a need for him. But the correction has to happen. The correction has to happen. Because a servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. Think back to your life growing up. There's a lot of things that you were told to do. Yeah, do this. Yeah, do this. Yeah. And then when it was crap, ah, I said, do this. Yeah, right away. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. Whatever the case might be. Because you had to be corrected. So now we're going to deal a little bit with chastisement. We're going to sum it up in one verse, because this, or one set of scriptures, because this is not a chastisement lesson. Let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. This pretty much sums up chastisement. 
But if you don't suffer chastisement from the Lord when he's correcting you, it's no different than a disobedient child that refuses to suffer correction when the father or mother is putting it on them. You do it with God, he'll cast you away. You keep doing it with your parents, sooner or later they're going to cast you away. You turn 18 and they boot you out of the house and change the lives. You don't want that. You don't want the Lord to cast you out of the house and change the lives to the kingdom, do you? That's called the lake of fire. Hebrews 12 and verse 5, brother, this one will start. 12 and 5, go ahead. And ye have forgotten the exaltation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastising of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. See, when you start getting miserable inside yourself and your peace leaves you, that's when you put that mirror up. Nine times out of ten, that's chastisement coming from the Lord, and you're slipping and falling somewhere, and you can't put your finger quite on it because you're miserable. Just no peace. Or maybe something material the Lord's going to decide to hit you that way with chastisement. Everything starts breaking. Sometimes it just it gets old, it just breaks. But when stuff starts happening to you, you need to take a look in the mirror and find out why first. The first thing you do when stuff starts happening is not go, oh, why me? The first thing you should do when stuff starts happening is go, what did I do, Lord? You take it to prayer, you put the mirror up. You take a look at why you're not at peace, why you're so miserable, why everything's falling apart around you. you got to take a look at yourself first, sisters and brothers. Because if the Lord is not pleased with you, he's going to show it to you. And he don't come down anymore and, hey, brother Paul, oh, yes, Lord. You're falling short. Oh, I'll correct it right away. That ain't the way it happens. You get that slap in the back of your head and it hits the wall and you start bleeding a little bit. And you go, man, why am I so miserable? What's going on with me? How come I, I don't have any peace right now? How come I'm short? How come I'm quick to anger and I'm usually not? You put that word up and you take a look at that first. Go ahead and continue, brother. Verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, chastiseth <coughs> and scorcheth every son whom he receives. Because who the Lord loves, he corrects. Just like when you love your children, you don't let them run wild and, and let them turn into a gangbanger and go buy an ammunition for their Uzi. You correct them when they start falling short. You don't want them heading down the wrong path. The same thing with our God. He ain't going to buy us no ammo for an Uzi. He's going to take that away from us and show us how we're supposed to be walking. And get us from running the streets and being crazy. He's going to correct us. Go ahead, brother. If he endure and chasten, God dealt with you as the son. For what son is he whom? For what son is he whom the father chastised not? And when the Lord is chastening you or correcting you, you endure that correction because you want to find out why you're not in his favor. Go ahead, brother. But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then ye be bastards and not sons. But if you don't deal with the chastisement, and you kick against the chastisement, and you keep going the way you're going, you're not his son anymore. He's going to deal with you like you're not his son. And a bastard is a fatherless person. And this is one father you don't want to be without. Go ahead, brother. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we have gained them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Yes, sir. Go ahead. For they verily for a few days chastened us after this own pleasure. But he, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. I might correct my, my children because the garbage is never out. It's not a commandment against the Lord unless you're willfully disobeying your mother and father. So I'm, I might kind of, all right, or this isn't where it's supposed to be. Or whatever it is, correcting after my own pleasure. Okay, as a father. But when the Lord does it, it's for our own good. That we might be partakers in his holiness. We correct as fathers. We have laws that govern our household that just keep the peace. And they're not God's commandments, but they're not against God's commandments. So though that's the chastening of our children after our own pleasure. Maybe this is where I like the knives, this is the way I like the dishes done, this is the way the cabinet should be set up. Don't forget the toilet paper's got to be in there. If you, the last one to get the toilet paper that runs out, whatever the case might be. But when God chastens us as corrects us, it's for our own good. Go ahead, brother. Now no chastening for the present seeming to be joyous, but grieving. And no correction, no correction is fun to go through, whether it's from God or anybody else. 
So even an employer at work, you screwed up big time. Oh, I gotta teach you. No correction is fun to go through. Go ahead, brother. Nevertheless, after we yield the peaceful fruit of the righteousness of the womb, unto them which are exercised thereby. But this is the whole reason for the chastening or the correction. It's because although it's not joyous but grievous, nevertheless, after the correction, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby or corrected by it. And then you get back on the path. You're back in God's good grace. And now he puts that peace back on you. He allows you to think soberly and sanely when the world's falling around, uh, part around you, instead of you getting all hectic, caught up with it. And now you're back on the path, and you're walking according to the commandments of God. And that's the whole reason for even being here today, is so that we can continue on that path and get that right back to the tree of life. Let's go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. I'm going to read one verse. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9 and 1 verse, verse 22, brother, come on. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. When you've repented and you've been baptized in the name of the Messiah Christ Jesus, and you're taking hold of that covenant, and you're walking according to that covenant, your blood has now been covered by Jesus, or your sins have now been covered by the blood of Jesus. Because almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without Jesus shedding his blood and you coming under that shed blood, you don't have any remission for any of your sins in the past. You must come under that shed blood of Jesus or you are going to suffer and die in your own sins at the appointed time. What a lot of people don't realize, sisters and brothers, you're on your own hook. Your actions dictate what side of the kingdom you're going to be in. Let's go to Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans 6. Romans 6. And we'll pick this up in verse 23. 6 and verse 23. Go ahead, brother. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. The shed blood of Jesus is a gift to all mankind. It's your opportunity to get that chance that you never had when Adam took it away from you. And now the Lord is calling you and you've accepted the call. You've taken hold of the covenant. You're walking according to his righteousness. And every once in a while you feel like it's 31 degrees outside and drizzling. And you get out there and you're walking, this daily walking. Whoa, whoa, it's a little slippery. And you continue to walk and all of a sudden there's a banana peel. Whoop, you go right down. You sin. You've done it to ignorance. You get back up. You accept the consequences. You take it to prayer. You ask the Lord. You talk to him. You get it forgiven. You accept the chastisement or the correction. If there is any immediately, sometimes it happens down the road. You don't even know. All of a sudden, you're going through a bunch of circumstances that seems to be that bad luck, but nothing's luck. This could be a sin that you did three years ago in ignorance. If the Lord's finally getting around and slapping you around a little bit. It's hard to do. Now smile through that. There's circumstances that I, my life was falling, around a, a falling apart around me, and I just started laughing, praising God. And there's other times that the smallest little, simplest little nothing Gets me so fun out of shape, I'll pick up the podium and draw it across your home. It's life. But if you're keeping God in your heart at all times, and when you start going through that junk that makes you want to throw things, put that mirror up and find out why. You start acting out against your normal personality, put that mirror up. Let's find out why. Your material world around you is falling apart. Put that mirror up first. Make sure it's not just stuff getting old and rusting away. Check yourself and see if it's you. Then you got to get back on track. You repent. You get back into that walk. Because the Lord wants to take care of you. He doesn't want anyone to suffer and die. Let's go to 1 Peter, the first chapter. 1 Peter, the first chapter. I'm not having you correct me anymore today, brother. I hope. 
<laughs> and you never know. First Peter one. First Peter one. Let's pick this up at verse eighteen, brother. First Peter one and verse eighteen. Taking hold of that shed blood, sisters and brothers. When you sin, something has to die. Almost all things are purged by blood. You come into the covenant, and this is what's happened. Verse 18. Go ahead, brother. For as so much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers. Sisters and brothers, make sure wherever you're at, don't listen to what your pastor says. Listen to what thus saith the Lord, so you don't fall into any vain conversation received by traditions from your father. If it's not out of the book, don't deal with it. If it is out of the book, rightly divide it. Make sure you got it right. Go ahead, brother. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish, and without spot. And we know that Christ Jesus is our Passover sacrifice. And he's just like that precious blood of Christ, that lamb without blemish, without spot. He was perfect. The Holy One of Israel. Go ahead, brother. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for it. Uh -huh. Who by him to believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, yes, sir. and gave him glory. That your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth from the Spirit unto all foreign love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So now we know that we weren't redeemed with the vain conversation received by traditions from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish and without spot. And it's, we believe that God raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And our faith and hope is in God the Father. And he's going to do the same thing to us. And we have purified our souls in obeying the truth. Obeying the truth, the word of God. Through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Sisters and brothers, we got to have all this. We can't just not set a tree up and just go to the Sabbath and keep the class and then rail on each other, lie on each other, cheat, steal. The Lord says we have to have unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one, one another with a pure heart fervently, fervently, urgently with everything that you have with that perfect heart, sisters and brothers. We were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. When we repent and we get baptized, we're supposed to walk as he walked. He's the Holy One of Israel. When we fall short, he's going to correct us to put us back on the path. Because his mercy endures forever. His mercy doesn't stop once you get baptized. It continues. He, once you get baptized, you are now his people. He's got you there, just like if I adopt a child. Once he's under my roof and under my rule and obeying my commandments, he's mine. And I want to nurture him. And I want to raise him and grow him up to be just like me. I'm not trying to teach my children to be disrespectful to elders and to lie, cheat, and steal. And I'm walking in the commandments of God and I'm doing everything opposite of what the world's doing. I'm trying to raise my children to be just like me. That's what our God is trying to do. Raise us to be just like him. And because of that, because he knows how we are, his mercy is going to be there forever. Absolutely forever. Seeing ye have purified your soul and obeying the truth through the Spirit, but the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Let's go to Psalm the 86th chapter. Psalm the 86th chapter. Too many people, sisters and brothers, take that love your neighbor and kick it to the side. But it's taught sometimes. I've had it taught, and I've almost taught it out of lesson. Well, to, to love somebody means to keep the commandments. So as long as you're not lying, cheating, and stealing from the next door neighbor, skip them, man. I'm loving them. No good mother cracker. That ain't love. That's not love, sisters and brothers. It's not love. Loving your neighbor is taking care of each other, not having cross words with each other, not railing on each other. We're going to cross the scripture in a little bit that's going to show you. Psalm 86, let's go to verse 5. 86 and 5, brother, go ahead. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive.
And he's good and he's ready to forgive. He wants to forgive us when we fall short. We followed every other commandment he's given us. We come into the covenant. We're walking according to his commandments. We're not keeping trees and eggs and everything in our house. We're loving our neighbor as ourselves. And then when we fall short, we go, oh, he'll never forgive me. No, he wants to forgive us. He wants to love on us. He wants to take care of us. He's brought us all the way up into the covenant, and now we're serving him, and we fall short, and we're just going to throw it in? Does that make any sense? Or... Hey, you do what you want to do. You want to throw it in and go back to Sunday worship or whatever you were doing before. That's on you. But I'm telling you, God is here to take care of you and to nurture you and to bring you up in his way, to help you grow spiritually, because he wants you to live and reign with him. But you got to do what you got to do. You absolutely have to do what you have to do. Skip the verse 15 and continue, brother. Okay, the second half is fine. Okay, finish that and skip the 15, brother. Um, and plentiness and mercy unto all them that call upon me. Um, but thou, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and graces, long suffering, repentance, and mercy and truth. Because God is a God that is full of compassion and gracious, long suffering or patient, very patient, and plenteous in mercy and in truth. Let's continue. Let's go back to Second Peter, this time the third chapter. Second Peter the third chapter. Well, we were in first Peter before. Let's go to Second Peter the third chapter. Second Peter the third chapter. Second Peter three. Second Peter 3. This is a verse you need to keep in your heart when you fall short and you get up and you get ready to repent. Second Peter 3 and verse 9, brother, go ahead. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering thus. Long suffering just means very, 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 very patient. And that's that's not evident to you in your walk that he's so patient and take a look at it a little closer sisters and brothers we could have been dead a long time ago we could have been dead a long time ago even after we came into this walk some of the foolishness we did but just like king david the lord saw your heart and he brought you along and he's forgiven your sin he's erased that sin when you sin through ignorance he's covering you with his shed blood because he's not slack concerning concerning his promise. He is long suffering to us. Go ahead, brother. Not willing that any should perish. But he doesn't want any of us to make it to the lake of fire. He wants all of us to make it to his kingdom. But he knows that there's going to be some that will not turn again. Go ahead, brother. But they all should come to repent. And he wants all to come to repentance. Let's go to Ezekiel the 18th chapter. Ezekiel the 18th chapter. Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, and we'll pick it up in verse 30, brother. Ezekiel 18 and verse 30. Go ahead. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, said the Lord God. And it's always everyone according to his ways. The Father won't suffer for the sins of the Son, and vice versa. It's according to your ways. Go ahead. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Go ahead. So iniquity shall not be your yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For will, for why will you die, O house of Israel? For why will you die? Why? Cast away your transgressions. Cast away your sin. Why do you want to die? Go ahead, brother. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. Because God doesn't have any pleasure in the death of him that dies. That's what he's trying to, to make clear to the nation of Israel here. He doesn't have any pleasure on punishing people. He doesn't have any pleasure on casting people aside. That's his created. All of us are his created. Just like you have a son or a daughter and they're just, for whatever reason, they won't listen to you. You don't want to take them out of your house. You want to correct them. You want them to see where they're falling short. God's no different. Go ahead, brother. Said the Lord God, Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Hey, turn yourselves and live. When you fall short, when you recognize you fall short. Sometimes with the Lord, it's not whether or not you fall short. It's your reaction when you realize you fell short. And when you realize you've sinned, what is your reaction? 
Well, yeah, I know, but you know, ah, whatever. Or you Lord, like that, like that brother. He's down, he won't even look up. He's smiling himself. Lord, I'm a sinner in need of your mercy. Or you like the Pharisee. Yeah, I give tithes of all, man. I fast, give tithes of wheat, whatever. I keep all the commandments, statutes, and judgments. Which one are you? The Lord says, when you sin, repent. Come before him. Come before him humbly. Seek the corrective measure that you need to take when you're miserable, when you're falling short. But don't cast power on it. Let's continue. Let's go to John, the third chapter. Let's see about this merciful cow. Let's go to John, the third chapter. The Gospel of John. This is probably the most widely used scripture in the New Testament. But the thing about this scripture, it's absolute. John 3, let's pick it up at verse 16. Brother, pray in 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because if you believe in Jesus, that's faith. And if you believe and you have faith in him, it turns to obedience. And now you'll have everlasting life. But this is how God so loved the world. Not so loved those that just pick up the covenant and start walking in it like you're something special. This is for everyone. This isn't just for you. And when you come into this and you start taking hold of that covenant, <coughs> it starts with those Ten Commandments. Every step of the way of spiritual growth with every ounce of knowledge you've got comes an ounce more of responsibility. Before long, you're walking into commandment statutes and judgments. You can quote verses left and right, upside down and backwards. You know where every important precept is in the book. But if you won't have charity or love, you don't have enough. The God that says take hold of the whole package. Not just part of it. I want the whole package. Verse 17, brother, go ahead. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn us. He didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn us. That's what sin does, though. It convinces us and condemns us that we need a Savior. But he didn't send Jesus in the world to condemn us. Go ahead. But that through the world, through him, might be saved. But that the world through Jesus might be saved. The world through Jesus might be saved. And Jesus even turned around and, and told us through his disciples that we're going to do greater things than him. Because he's going to see at the right hand of the Father. It's our life that's going to bring others to him. And if you're beating yourself up because you've fallen short, and you're questioning your walk, how is that being a light? How is that being a light to others? Beat yourself up. It's a good thing to beat yourself up. And it's a very good thing to beat yourself up. But beat yourself up to the point of repentance and come back to him. Put your finger on where you're falling short. If you're falling short, take the corrective measures and keep going. You can't be up to somebody when you're whining about how bad you've sinned and you're over you're all depressed and everything. How are you going to be of help to someone else? You can't. And this is a merciful God that is not looking to end your life, physically or spiritually. He's looking to give you a better opportunity to gain that spiritual life. He's looking at giving you every ounce of breath you have in this life to not only take care of those that are yours but to be of help to others and help let your light shine to guide them into the covenant. Let's continue. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter. I can't even see a clock. I hope I'm not going too far here, or too long, rather. <clears throat> Romans, the fifth chapter. Me being human, I forgot to start the recording, but we'll get it off YouTube later. Romans 5. And we'll pick it up further at verse 12. 5 and 12. Go ahead. Wherefore, as by one man's sin enter into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. It's by one man said that, or by one man sin entered into the world, and then death because of that sin. So sin is passed upon all men because we've all sinned. This is talking about Adam's transgression. Go ahead and continue, brother. Let's get but, down to 15 and continue. But not as the offense. So also is the free gift. But not as the offense, so as the offense was, so also is the free gift. Go ahead. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. Because of Adam, many be dead. Go ahead. Much more the grace of God and the gift by God, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have abundantly and have abounded unto many. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace that shed blood of Jesus is going to abound unto many. 
One man sinned, many died. Jesus comes and sets the record straight. He suffers and dies for the sins of the world. And that is going to bring many into his covenant. And it's going to take the sins of many. And it's going to erase them through the shed blood of Jesus. Um, go ahead and continue, bro. And not as it was by one that sinned. So is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. By Adam to condemnation, go ahead. But the free gift but the free gift or grace, go ahead. Is of many offenses and to justification. Is of many offenses. The sins of the world under justification. Unto justification. Justification means you're cleared of guilt. I shoot somebody 15 times, the police come, they arrest me. They take me away. They lock me up. Now when it comes to court, the judge wants to find out why I shot somebody 15 times. And under the investigation, they see that they shot at me 300 times first. I'm justified for my shooting. I'm just walking down the street. Bullets start flying. I pull out my piece. Pop, 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 pop. I'm legal to carry it. I'm justified for what I've done. We are justified by the shed blood of Jesus. He's covered all those sins. We're justified our sins are justified by his shed blood. If we come under that blood. Tell us where you're at and continue, brother. Um, Romans 5, 18. Uh -huh. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift, came upon all men to justification of life. So just like the offense of one judgment came upon all men when Adam sinned, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, we're all sinners. Jesus, when he came and he suffered and he died for us, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men of the justification of life. But you got to take hold of that shed blood. Go ahead, brother. For it's by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Uh -huh. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This God is a merciful God, a gracious God, long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. He laid it out there. He went to the movies. He paid for all the tickets. You want to make it to the show? Go up there and say, uh, part of the Christ Jesus uh, party. Oh, I got that ticket for you right here, sir. He's already paid the debt. All you've got to do is accept the gift. You've already done that. You've come under the shed blood of Christ. You're walking in the covenant, the commandments, the statutes, and judgments. Now life is just getting you down, and you don't know where to turn, and it's beating you up, and you don't know what you're going to do. You start feeling guilty for you falling short. You start looking like God will never have nothing to do with you again. Repent and turn back to him. He's in your court. He wants you to succeed. He's just like a father that's given children every tool that they can possibly have to succeed. It's the same way with your God. Go ahead, brother. Continue. That as sin hath reigned unto death, uh -huh. even so might grace reign through righteousness and to eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. That as sin has reigned unto death from Adam. Even so, might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. You're taking hold of that covenant, sisters and brothers. You're walking in that covenant. You're doing the very best you can to have a perfect heart. You start falling short, get back on that path. Even if you can't forgive yourself, come before your God. Throw yourself at his feet. Where else are you going to go? There's only one other place to go, and that's the fire. Let's continue. Let's go to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Let's look closely at one of God's attributes. Because when people beat themselves up over falling short, this is the biggest thing they struggle with. But God gives us examples of this. God gives us examples of everything in his word that deals with our daily walk. He might not call it specifically this, that, or the other. But if you look, you'll see the examples. Matthew 18. Let's pick it up at verse 21, brother. Matthew 18 and 21. This is an attribute of your God. Go ahead, brother. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how art shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him? 
till seven times. So, Lord, if I sin against you through ignorance, how many times are you going to forgive me, Lord? Seven times? What does Lord tell Peter? Go ahead, brother. Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And now, unto seventy times seven doesn't mean break out the calculator and start multiplying. The Lord's not saying seven times seventy. He's saying as often as your brother repents and comes to you for forgiveness, forgive him. That's the attitude of our God. He is trying to raise us up with the mindset that he has. With the heart that he has, like David's heart was, it was a perfect heart. It was a man after God's own heart. David slipped and fell. David returned and got back on track. You slip and fall. Look at what your God tells you about people slipping and falling in your life. Because he's given you an example of his grace and mercy. As often as you fall short and you really sincerely want to repent and turn to him, He's a gracious and loving God. He's going to forgive you your sins as long as it's through ignorance. You haven't completely turned away and said, skip you, Lord. He's there to put you back on track. We're human beings, sisters and brothers. If a man after God's own heart can commit adultery, murder, and completely spit in God's face by doing something he said not to do when he numbered Israel, and he had mercy on David, yes, you've got the consequences of the action, but he still had mercy. You don't think he's going to be merciful to you? He's going to be merciful to you. He's going to help you get back on track. But you got to suck it up. Put those emotions to the side. Repent and get back on track. Look at yourself in the mirror. Don't look at your husband or your children or the guy next door or the chick down the street, whatever. Look at yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror. You hold your own salvation. Let's continue, brother. Let's go to Proverbs, the 24th chapter. Proverbs, the 24th chapter. And we're getting close. we got a few more. Proverbs 24, we're going to read one verse, brother. 24 and verse 16. 24 and 16. This is a servant of God. Go ahead, brother. For a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall into mystery. A just man falls seven times and rises up again. Now, again, the Lord's not saying just seven times. You're a righteous man, you're a just man, you're going to fall. But you get back up. Sometimes with the Lord, it's not what you've done, it's your reaction to what you've done. I can only imagine if Saul, when he realized that he didn't kill all those animals, would have dropped to his knees and repented. The Lord might have had mercy. I don't know. The Lord says he's got mercy on whom he has mercy. It's not my place to say who gets it and who doesn't. But it's my place to teach you as a man standing up here teaching you the word of God, that you need to get back up. You can't just lay there. You fall, you get back up. It might be slow. You might be bouncing off the ropes with every step of trying to get to your feet, but you've got to get back up, sisters and brothers. Where else are you going to go? You can't go anywhere else. You, you fall from this, and you decide that you're not going to do what you know is the truth because you've been baptized and everything else, and you just throw the towel in, you got nowhere else to go but the towel. You get back up, you start walking, you ask for forgiveness, you truly repent, you got a chance. I'm not saying he's gonna be merciful and, and accept your repentance, but you got a chance. You don't have that if you blatantly turn away. A lot of people I talk to on Facebook, a lot of people I know, some people in my own family, they struggle sometimes. I myself struggle sometimes. But I see people on Facebook, I see people wanting to leave this race, wanting to walk away from this walk. Don't do it. Don't do it. You have people around you, they'll continue to walk. You'll hurt them because your sin does have consequences. But guess what? They'll get over it. The Lord will protect them. If they're walking the best that they can do, the Lord will protect those people. He takes care of his own. You want to turn, I'm telling you not to, but if you do, those consequences for your action are on your head, not mine. I'm trying to teach you how merciful this God is as you're doing your everyday walk. Pay attention to the sisters and brothers. There's a lot of scriptures we left out, too. Pay attention to this. He's a merciful God. He's on your side. He wants you to succeed. 1 John, the second chapter. 1 John, the second chapter. 
They always talk about I'm not going there. First John 2. First John 2. I know you were rough crowd. I'm not even joking today. First John 2, and let's pick it up to verse 1. 2 and 1. Go ahead, brother. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. A lot of us don't see past the first half of this uh, of this scripture. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. That's a good mindset to have. I'm going to walk so I don't sin. But if you do sin, or should I say, when you do sin, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You're beating yourself up and falling short. Maybe you've done the same thing the same way, the same reaction again. And you're just, oh, man. Where am I going to turn? Turn to the Father. You have an advocate with him. An advocate's like a lawyer. You've got that advocate Christ Jesus. Go ahead, brother. And he is the probation for our sins. And he's the sacrifice or the atonement, the propitiation for our sins. Go ahead. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And not just for us as servants, but for the sins of the whole world. Remember, he's long-suffering, doesn't want any to perish. Go ahead, brother. And hereby we do not know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. But the point I'm making here is we have that advocate with the Father. We have that advocate. We have that go-between. When you fall short, you've got a place to turn. Don't try to crawl into a hole and pull the, the dirt in behind you. You've got a place to turn, sisters and brothers, when you sin through ignorance. And if your ignorance is borderline presumptuous, throw yourself on his mercy and see what happens. Let's go to 1 Timothy, the second chapter. 1 Timothy, the second chapter. First Timothy 2. And we'll pick it up in verse 1. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. Brother, go ahead. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And that's supposed to be part of our prayer life right there. We're supposed to be having... Uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and givings of thanks to be made for all men. That's supposed to be part of our prayer life. Praying for each other. Go ahead, brother. For kings and for all that are in authority. And there's other scriptures that tell you you're supposed to be praying for kings and for all of those that are in authority. Not cutting doll, President Obama, that's that and the other. Whether I like him or don't like him, voted for him, didn't vote, never voted, who cares? I still am supposed to be praying for him, for the Lord to lead him and guide him righteously. To take care of America. I'm not supposed to be all that no good Obama. Oh, look at him again. They should have impeached him years ago. It's not supposed to come out of my mouth. Whether or not I voted for him or not. Whether I care whether he's president or not. I'm supposed to be praying for him. Go ahead, brother. That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And that's why we're supposed to be praying for our leaders to be thinking soberly and sanely. So we can lead a godly and honest life. Go ahead. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Who would have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. But this doesn't mean everyone is going to come into the knowledge of the truth. The Lord would have all come into the knowledge of the truth. But he even had it written that the Gentiles that don't know the law, the other nations, that keep the law, are law unto themselves. Well, not everybody's going to find out exactly what the Lord would have them do. But if they're walking righteously to the best of their ability, according to the scripture, they've got a shot at it too. But that heart that's right, that's keeping the law, and they're a law to themselves, will surely be drawn by your life if you are feeling sorry for yourself and get up, take a look at yourself in that mirror, and continue to walk. And continue to walk, to do this walk, to do what the Lord would have us do. Go ahead, brother. Well, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, or one advocate between the Father and us, and that's Christ Jesus. Let's go to Second Corinthians, the tenth chapter. Second Corinthians, the tenth chapter. Second Corinthians, ten. 
2 Corinthians 10. And we're going to pick this up at verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, brother, and verse 5. Go ahead, brother. Casting down imitation, imagination, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Guard in your heart. The casting down of imaginations is guard in your heart. Fill it with the word of God. Casting of imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Go ahead. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Pardon your heart. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ Jesus. Go ahead, brother. And having in a readiness to revenge all of this obedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, when you get your righteous change, and now you're sitting and judging. We all can't wait for that. We all can't wait to make the kingdom. I try not to even look at having a throne set aside for me. That's the farthest thing on my mind right now. What I want to do is, Father, please forgive me. Let me make it to the kingdom. Now when I get there, he hands me a throne. Praise you, Lord. Let me go do my job. Right? But that's what we're doing. We're casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against God. We're bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have in readiness to revenge all disobedience once our reward for our obedience is fulfilled. Go ahead, brother. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If and any man trusts himself that he is Christ, uh -huh. let him or himself think this again. Go ahead. That as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. So having the readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled and all this guarding of your heart and everything, do you then look on things after the outward appearance? The Lord told us not to judge a book by its cover in many places. He told the Pharisees, you look great on the outside, but the inside your cup is filthiness and abomination. So having the guarding of your heart and being ready to revenge all disobedience when you get your reward and all of this, do you look on things after the outward appearance, or do you judge righteously? Because look at what this says, bro. brothers and sisters. Go ahead. Uh, pick it up in verse 7 again. Read verse 7 again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Forget do ye look on things after the outward appearance? So having all this righteousness and everything, do you look at the things after the outward appearance? Go ahead, brother. If any man trusts in himself that he is Christ. So if any of you trust you are in yourself that you are of Christ, that you are Christ Jesus, that you are a servant, and that he is your God, and you are his people. If any of you trust in Christ, go ahead. Let him of himself think this again. Let him of himself think this again. Go ahead. That as he is Christ. That as he is Christ, go ahead. Even so are we Christ. Even so are we Christ. Even so are we Christ. You got one brother stepping up saying, I'm a servant of the true and living God. I serve the great God of Israel. Well, what does it say? Take a step back, brother. It's so the weak. How does everyone else that professes to be a servant of God that's taking hold of that covenant, taking hold of those high days, taking hold of the dietary law, the cleanliness law, and that big capital, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself. So you think that you're Christ Jesus? Well, so are we. So is everyone that professes that faith. You got to be careful on how you treat each other, too. got to be careful on how you treat each other. But that's for another lesson. Let's go to Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews, the second chapter. You fall short. You beat yourself up. You can't even imagine getting back up and, and even beginning to get back into this race. You're so filled with guilt. You're so filled with remorse. Man, you don't even want people to know what you did. Whatever it was. And it might not be anything that that is such a big deal. But to you, it is a big deal. To you, it is something that's grievous. To you, it's bothering you because you know you've sinned against God and you don't have any idea how he can ever forgive you. But he wants to forgive you. He's giving you corrective measures you need to take. It shows his grace and mercy and law and suffering. He's giving you chastisement. He's giving you that ability to look in the mirror. 
He's given you that opportunity to get the life, the, the right back to that tree of life. He's doing everything that he can possibly do to put you back on that path. Take a look and listen to him. He's calling you to put you back on that path. Listen to what he's trying to tell you. Endure that chastisement. Get back and start walking. Hebrews 2, and let's pick it up at verse 16. Brother 2 and 16, go ahead. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Talking about Jesus, go ahead. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So now he could have taken on himself like the nature of an angel. He could have just came down as God, but he had to come down and suffer and die for our sins. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. You know, Jesus is your brother and your friend. A true brother and friend doesn't try to get you to stumble and fall so that he can steal from you. A true brother and friend is going to help you walk down the path that you need to be going down. Jesus is your brother and friend. He made like unto his brethren. Go ahead. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. And he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to secure them that are tempted. And because of that, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He's able to be your advocate and your mediator. And more than that, he wants to go to the Father for you. He knows what it's like to fall short. He's been tempted just like you've fallen short. He knows what this flesh is all about. You slip and you fall. When you see that you've fallen, get repented. Get repented. Repent and come back to him. You'll never know whether or not he's going to cast you aside unless you come back to him anyway. Who first you went, brother? Are you done with 18? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. And then we have two more after this. 1 Peter, the 5th chapter. <coughs> 1 Peter 5. First Peter 5, and let's pick it up in verse 8. Brother. 5 and 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And he is walking around, seeing whom he might devour. He is walking around and he's seeing if he can take you with. And when he finds you all written in guilt and you're laying back there and you're wondering how can anyone ever forgive you, you know what he's doing? Yeah, that's right, brother Paul. I ain't never going to forgive you for this one. Man, look at how you hurt all these people through your wickedness, man. Father ain't never going to forgive you, brother Paul. Ever. But what you need to do is you need to keep your heart guarded. Keep your heart, your mind on the Word of God. You need to get back up on track, endure that chastisement, and be that ambassador that Brother Devin talks about. Be that ambassador of Christ Jesus. Let your light shine. Now you can help other people. Yeah, you know, I did this and I don't know. You know what? Yeah, I, I was in the same boat you were in a few years back. Well, what did you do, Brother Paul? Dust it off my seat. Dust it off my knees. Put that mirror in front of me. And I continue to walk. If I need to seek wise counsel, I'm going to seek wise counsel. If I need to seek being prayed over by the elders, I'm going to seek, I'm going to seek being prayed by, over by the elders. If I don't need to do nothing but just dig back into this book and take it to my God and let him take care of me, then get up and do that. But don't stay stagnant. Just don't lay there. you got to get back up and you got to start walking. Because you've got to run this race and endure until the end. When you start feeling like you're the only one, Elijah felt that way at one time too. And the Lord said, I got plenty reserved for me. You ain't alone. It's the same way today. Brethren are falling short, just like you are, all over the world, in the same exact circumstances and situations. You're not unique. Get back up and get walking. Let's go to Rome. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 1 Peter 5. And we're at verse 9. 1 Peter 5 and verse 9. Go ahead. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Yes, sir. Go ahead. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto the eternity glory, the eternal glory of by Jesus Christ, 
after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory. Go ahead. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Forever and ever. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will make you perfect. Will establish you in some and strengthen you. You start getting beat up, you're beating yourself up. Ask the Lord for strength. Ask the Lord first, ask Him to put a finger on what's bothering you, what's got you so crazy. Then repent and then ask Him for strength. Ask Him to help you get established. Ask Him to help make your heart perfect. He wants you to cast all cares upon Him, He doesn't want any to die. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter. Let's look at this daily grind one more time. Romans, the fifth chapter. Because this daily grind, sisters and brothers, sometimes it's a mother scratch. I'll be the first one to admit it. It really is. It could really be something sometimes, sisters and brothers. But God always makes a way for you. God always makes a way for you. Romans 5. And let's pick it up at verse 3. This is that daily grind. Romans 5 and verse 3. Go ahead. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works in patience. It's not easy to glory in tribulation when you're going through tribulation. But what does tribulation do? In patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Which is given unto us. Yes, sir. So we glory in tribulation. We don't do it when we're in it, but we need to start practicing that, thinking about that. When you're in a tribulation, you should be glory. You should be giving glory to the Father. Because tribulation works patience. Tribulation works patience. Remember, our whole duty while we're fearing God and keeping his commandments, the whole reason behind that whole duty is to make you just like him. To give you that mindset. And the way you're going to get that mindset is through tribulation. Because tribulation is going to work patience. Remember, a servant will not be corrected by words. So if the Lord puts us through all these little tribulations to help work on our patience. Knowing that tribulation is worth patience. And then patience works experience. The next time you're in that situation, you should have the patience to take a step back. And your experience won't have you fall the same way. Tribulation works patience, patience experience, and experience gives you hope. Because now when you stay away from that situation and you respond differently as you're growing spiritually, you now have hope. Because you're seeing you're not falling the same way. And the Lord is leading and guiding you. And that gives you that hope. And hope make it not a shame. Go ahead, brother. Read verse 5. And hope make him not ashamed, because the Lord of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And because hope doesn't make us ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. So when you fall short and you fall down, don't stay in that beating yourself up. Don't stay ashamed of your sin. Bring it up to the forefront. Acknowledge your sin before you got your God and ask for repentance. And get back up on track and start walking that walk. Remember, you're going to have to suffer for your sins. You're going to have to deal with those consequences for those actions. And sometimes the Lord says it goes to the third and fourth generation. But that doesn't mean he's going to hold you guilty for those sins. He's going to forgive those sins to ignorance. But you still got to pay for them. But while you're paying for them, keep walking. Keep walking that walk. You can't afford to sit back and just suffer and die. I guarantee you, if you sit back and just, well, I'm just going to throw the towel on, it ain't going to be long. I've seen people before turn from the Lord. I've seen some die. I've seen some get, uh, I've seen some get rewarded initially, so it seemed, but then the reward wasn't for God. I've seen people slip away into a reprobate mind real quick where you couldn't even carry out a conversation with them and understand half of what they're saying. I had one brother, I'm going to tell you, I used to go to class, there was a five-and-dime store on a corner. Brother went to class with me for years. 
was walking side by side with me. All of a sudden, he ended up in the hospital. He come back to class. He's going in the five and dime store. A brother that was grounded, buying candy and drinks and stuff to go to class with. Him. On a Saturday, and he knew he wasn't supposed to buy himself. Now, unfortunately, that brother's not a live dog anymore. He's a dead lion. The Lord put him down. We tried to show him and tried to get him to repent, but the Lord wasn't here. You have a sober mind. You're thinking sanely and soberly now, and you're falling short, and you're thinking that God will never forgive you. You got nowhere else to go. Acknowledge your sin, repent, and throw yourself on his mercy. You might be one of those thousands who will be merciful to you. And if not, what are you going to do? You got nowhere else to go. Throw yourself on his mercy and beg him if that's what it takes. But you've got to get back in this game. You've already taken hold of the covenant. He's a merciful God, doesn't want to see you fall short. And when you throw yourself on him, he just might be merciful to you. But one thing's for sure, if you've just flat out turned from this, ain't no mercy coming. It's over. It is over. What verse are you at, brother? Six. Go ahead and continue. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the young God. And I was ungodly when Christ died for me. I wasn't even around. But as soon as I came into being a young child and I sinned, Christ died for me already. He's got that ticket waiting for me at the box office at the movie theater. And he's telling me, whenever you're ready for it, come and get it. And if you don't come and get it, I'll give it to somebody else. His grace and his mercy is there, and it's for the entire world. The last thing you want to do when you come into this walk is fall short and throw in the towel. You're halfway there. You're in the walk. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Put them blinders on. Get back up and give it everything that you've got. Give it that final resolve. You're going to make it to the end. You fall in short, seek wise counsel. You a brother falling short, seek counsel from brothers. You a sister falling short, seek wise counsel from sisters. But just don't sit back and do nothing. Go ahead and continue, brother. But scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, preadventure, for a good man, some will even dare to die. Go ahead. But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. Yes, sir. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Much more than being now justified by his blood or clear of guilt for our sins of the past, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Go ahead. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, remember, when he suffered and died, it was for the sins of the whole world, including us. But while we were enemies, we were reconciled to the Father by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's why he had to suffer, die, and be resurrected, accepted by the Father like we did. We had that um, um, Passover and unleavened bread. We had the wave sheep offering was done, and then we did the count the Pentecost. Jesus being that wave sheep, by his life we shall be saved. But we can't throw that towel in. Last place, sisters and brothers. Last place, Psalm the 37th chapter. Psalm the 37th chapter. I know I was all over the place today. There were a bunch of precepts in this lesson. I hope I didn't confuse everybody too much. But the one thing I do want everybody to take out of this, you're a servant of God and you're walking according to his commandments, statutes, and judgments. When you fall short, he's there for you. He's a merciful and powerful and merciful and long-suffering guy. And he doesn't want to see you fall short. And he's already got you. As one of his servants, as one of his people, he wants to keep you that way. The one that's putting all this doubt and craziness in your heart is Satan. He's the one that wants to drag you away from God. But God's not going to play tug of war. You got work, you got to do. Repent, get back on track. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And this is an undeniable truth. We'll pick it up in verse 23 and we'll end with this. 37 and 23, brother. Go ahead. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And they are. And he delighteth in his way. And he does. When you're walking according to his commandments, statutes, and judgments, he's delighting in you. Go ahead, brother. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Yes, sir. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, now I am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor has his nor his seed begging bread. This is David writing this. 
I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed back of bread. And this is David who sinned those grievous sins against the Lord. And this is David saying he was young and now he's old and he has not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed back of bread. He repented. He got back on track. The Lord put it in his house to suffer the consequences of his sin, but forgave him them sins. And David came under that shed blood of Christ Jesus. That's an example of what we need to do, sisters and brothers. We fall short, we need to get back up, and we need to throw ourselves on this mercy that endures for us. And as his servant, he hears your prayers. When you fall short and you repent, he hears your prayers. He's there for you. I want a man, I want to just tattoo that on your foreheads if I could. He is there for you. When you look in the mirror and you're looking for corrective actions, it's pleasing to your creator. That's what he wants you to do. He's trying to pick you up and to mold you to become just like him. Two cannot walk together unless they agree. You can't just always be a gracious giver. Sometimes you've got to be a gracious receiver, and that means coming before him humbly. With a broken and contrite heart when you sin, and throwing yourself on his mercy. And his mercy, sisters and brothers, it endures forever. Go ahead and continue, brother. He is ever merciful and lended, yes, sir. and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. And when you fall fallen short and you repent, depart from that evil and do good and dwell forevermore. Go ahead. For the Lord loveth, loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. Yes, sir. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. You might think that you've done some kind of some grievous act that the Lord will never forgive you. Look at the examples of some of these sisters and brothers that are in this book that have fallen short. And look at how the Lord has forgiven them. Yes, you do have to answer for your sins. And you do have to suffer the consequences for your actions. But you don't have to turn away from this merciful God. Because he is there for you. He wants, he's in your corner. He's picking you up. He's there to pick you up and put you back on the path. But you've got to do your part to allow him to help you get back on track. His mercy endures forever. So I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to rightly divide God's word. And I hope somebody got something from this lesson.